Did you know that Chicago once had a gangster so vicious that he built a soundproof torture chamber in his own home where he lived with his family? Sam DiStefano made his money through loan sharking, though he is said to have preferred lending money to those who could not pay him back. This gave him an excuse to use extreme cruelty and his favorite tool, an ice pick. He also carried out contracts on behalf of organized crime, but he was never allowed to become a made man due to his psychotic nature. In one horrific circumstance, one of his victims was chained up for an extended period of time before the psychopath had the man's own family go to the bathroom on him. Keep in mind that the majority of Sam Stefano's victims were degenerate gamblers, and so their names have been lost to time. But those that we do know of give us clear insight into the actions and mind of Sam Stefano. Now, before we begin, if you could do me a favor and hit the like button, and if you're not already, subscribe. Thanks. Sam Stefano was born on September 13, 1909 in Strader, Illinois. His parents were Italian immigrants who had come to the U.S. six years before. His father, Samuel Stefano Sr., started working in the U.S. as a laborer and coal miner, but eventually worked his way up to selling real estate. One of the reasons that Sam Sr. left the life of a coal miner was an event referred to as the Heron Massacre. Soon after Sam was born, the family moved to the town of Heron where the father worked in a mine. There was a labor dispute between the owner of the mine and the United Mine Workers of America Union in 1922. The conflict culminated in a shootout between the striking union members and the mine's guards. 23 people would end up losing their lives in the conflict. The De Stefanos would end up leaving Heron after the confrontation, moving to Chicago's Little Italy. In Chicago, the young Sam would start getting into trouble, associating with a gang of youths on the west side. In 1927, De Stefano and another boy named Ralph Orlando were arrested for assaulting a teenage girl and were found guilty of committing one of the most vile crimes against her. Sam was sentenced to three years in prison, and considering the crime, it seems like an extremely light sentence. A teenage girl had been kidnapped and assaulted by a group of seven gang members. After getting out of prison in 1930, he would join the 42 gang, which was led by Salvatore Giancana, who would later become a leader of the infamous Chicago outfit. The organization was involved in illegal alcohol sales and gambling, in addition to other operations. Many of the members of the 42 would go on to have careers in the Chicago Mafia, but Di Stefano would never be able to cross over to Made Man. Sam would also be on the receiving end of some of the violence, such as being injured by a cop during a grocery store robbery in 1932 and showing up at a hospital a few months later with gunshot wounds. This crime spree culminated with an arrest for bank robbery in 1933 in Wisconsin. Di Stefano would be sentenced to 40 years, but had this sentence commuted by the governor and released in 1944. In 1942, while he was still locked up, Sam Sr. passed away at 77 years old. Three years after his 1944 release in 1947, Sam would be back behind bars after he was caught running a counterfeit ration coupon operation. This time he was sent to Leavenworth Prison, where he rubbed shoulders with established mobsters from the Chicago outfit, such as Paul Rica and Louis Campagna. These connections would come in handy when he was released and got a job back in Chicago working in the local dump. Once back home in Chicago, he would also soon begin his loan sharking operation. Di Stefano would fund this operation with business that he had from his days before prison, and he would also use the illegal proceeds to buy real estate and manipulate local politics, eventually holding influence over aldermen, judges, and policemen. But it was in the process of collecting debts that Sam's true evil showed itself. While the point of lending money is to earn money from the interest incurred, he had a different goal. Di Stefano is said to have lent money to gamblers and did not shy away from doing business with people that he knew would not be able to repay the loan. Whether he just wanted to make an example of delinquent borrowers or he simply liked to torture people, Sam went as far as to install a soundproof torture chamber in his home where he lived with his wife and children. But one of the first to go was not a debtor, it was instead his brother. The monster had brought his brothers Mario and Michael into organized crime, and while Mario was a good fit for the lifestyle, Michael had issues adapting. And these issues led to addiction problems, 
as he struggled to cope with the pressure and violence. But the mob cannot have loose ends or weaknesses in their criminal pursuits. The outfit passed down the order that Michael had to go. Eager to live up to the expectations of his bosses, Sam carried out the hit. On September 17, 1955, police got a report of a body in a trunk in Chicago. When they arrived, they found Michael DiStefano, who had been shot, but not in the head, and there had been efforts to clean him up. It is suspected that Mario helped Sam carry out this crime. For victims who were not family members, Sam preferred using an ice pick over firearms. When someone was unable to repay their loans, he would get them into his basement torture chamber, then use the ice pick to coerce them to find a way to get the money that they owed. Sometimes he would go too far and simply ended their lives, whether intentionally or accidentally. One of these targets was a man named Arthur Adler. Adler was a nightclub owner, and one of his businesses was the Tradewinds Cafe and Lounge. In early 1960, he had run up quite a debt with Mad Sam and ended up in the creature's basement. Early on, though, in the process of encouraging him to find a way to pay Sam back, Artie's heart gave out, ending the monster's fun prematurely. So Sam stashed his body in a sewer where it would remain until it was discovered on March 28, 1960 by some road workers. Sam was soon a suspect and was visited by an FBI agent named William Romer. He would describe a bizarre scene. Di Stefano would meet with him wearing pajamas, with certain parts of his body hanging out and clearly visible. The creature's wife would serve them coffee, which the agent would later find out had been urinated in by Sam. One of the most brutal crimes that Di Stefano would commit was against one of his own collection men, named William Action Jackson. The large man was used to intimidate borrowers into paying their debts, but there was no loyalty between him and Sam. When Jackson was accused of working with the feds, he was immediately added to the hit list. In early August 1961, Jackson was brought to a meatpacking plant. There he underwent a horrific session of torture and depravity. Bats, hammers, cattle prods, ice picks, a firearm, a blowtorch, and a meat hook all played a role. But through it all, Jackson denied that he had informed on any of his fellow gangsters. Eventually, he was left hanging from his sensitive area on the meat hook, where he would pass away after three days. Action Jackson's remains were found in a trunk on August 12th in Chicago. Leo Foreman was a real estate agent who also moonlit as a lender for Di Stefano. After he came up short in his payments to Sam, the gangster confronted him, and Leo ended up throwing him out of his real estate office, enraging Sam. So his brother Mario kidnapped Leo and brought him to the infamous basement. Once again, the violence used was extreme, with hammers and bats being used to break his kneecaps, sensitive area, and hands. A knife was also used to remove portions of skin from the body, and an ice pick was jabbed into him repeatedly. Eventually, Sam got tired of playing with Leo and used a firearm to finish him off, leaving the body in an abandoned car. Those who owed Sam money were not the only ones targeted, and even his own family were not off limits. In one case, after his wife made him mad, Sam kidnapped a man at gunpoint and forced him to have relations with her as he watched. By the mid-1960s, law enforcement was hot on Sam's trail looking for any reason to bring him in. And in May of 1964, they got what they wanted. Sam was charged with illegally voting because as a felon, he was not eligible but he saw it as an opportunity to put on a show. Sam arrived to the courthouse wearing his pajamas and riding in a wheelchair. After several outbursts, the judge told him to be quiet, at which time Sam whipped out a megaphone and began shouting, earning himself a charge for contempt of court. Another of Sam's employees who earned his wrath was a man named Peter Capaletti. Peter had tried to steal $25,000 of Sam's money, which was an obvious no-no. But the mobster's net had wide reach, and Capaletti was found hiding out in Milwaukee. What well, would happen next is one of the most cited pieces of evidence for Di Stefano's viciousness. Mario and Sam brought Peter to the restaurant that Mario owned. They chained him to a radiator in the basement, then began beating him in a session that would last more than three days. While this was going on, Sam threw a party in the restaurant with judges, policemen, mobsters, and Capaletti's own family in attendance. Once everyone had finished eating, Capaletti was brought out naked, burned and bleeding as Sam explained that Peter had stolen from him. Some sources say that the mobsters urinated on him before bringing him out, 
while others have the victim's own family being the ones forced to relieve themselves on Capoletti. Either way, this sent a clear message to everyone in the community. Sam Di Stefano was not to be messed with. In 1965, Di Stefano was incarcerated again, this time for conspiracy, and spent a few years behind bars. Despite his legal problems, Sam was pulling in up to a million dollars a year through his illegal operations, but nothing can last forever. In February of 1972, Di Stefano was convicted of threatening a witness, Charles Cremaldi, who had given evidence about the death of Leo Foreman. And a few months later, he received additional charges for illegal possession of a firearm. During these trials, Sam would again act out, drawing unwanted attention to his fellow gangsters. Since these trials involved co-defendants, the outfit took the flamboyant behavior more seriously than before. In early 1973, there was a secret meeting where the boss of the outfit, Tony Accardo, ordered Di Stefano's crew to take him out. Much as with their brother Michael, Mario did not hesitate to help arrange the hit. On April 14, 1973, Sam went to Mario's home for a meeting with his brother and their associate, Tony Spilatro. As Mario and Sam chatted in the garage, Spilatro approached with a shotgun and fired twice, blasting off Sam's left arm at the elbow and filling his chest with lead. It seemed that no one cared much about the passing of such an evil SOB, as no one was ever charged with the shooting that ended Di Stefano's reign of terror. <laughs>